I'm going to try to do for chapter four what Zach did for chapter two in his teaching. And I'm gonna make James all about God's grace. And that's quite an undertaking. And I'm glad I did this the last, well, I started this two weeks ago and then I put it off, the rest of it off until day before yesterday, but, <laughs> and finished yesterday. But I'm glad it was done beforehand because if I'd have tried to do it tonight, I'd have been up here wigging it and doing that with very little brain power left. But let's start by reading it and then we'll dissect it. James chapter four, verse one. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war with you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever, washes, or whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes, his him, makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. <laughs> Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. I was tempted to say when you come in late, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Okay, everybody, mourning. No more laughter. And your joy to gloom. That's real cheery stuff. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. <coughs> what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Okay, I'm going to go back and start with the opening question that James poses there. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? None of you fight or quarrel any, right? So we can skip this part. No. He immediately answers us with a second question, which I presume is rhetorical, and it goes like this. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? I'm pretty sure we all know what quarreling and fighting is. Not from experience, but you've at least heard about it. But I want to look at one word in this answer in more depth. Passions. In English, we have a broad meaning of passion, and the connotation of that is often good. You can be passionate for God. You can be passionate about football. That may or may not be a good thing, but we know we got some pastors that are. There are a lot of things that we spend our passion on that are good things or 
at least neutral things. So passion for us really does not indicate a negative. I'm passionate for my wife. That's a good thing. I'm passionate for my children. I spent all day with one of them today, and that was joyful and painful. I'm passionate for a good steak. Will I kill for it? Probably not, but not even the cow. If I have to butcher it, I'll, I'll eat chicken. I think I could kill a fish or a chicken, but couldn't look at a cow in his eyes and then eat him. But the Greek word used here is hedone. And that looks like hedone in English. It's H-E-D-O-N-E, which might give you a little bit more of an idea of what the meaning is. In Greek, it has a very specific and a negative meaning. It's sensual pleasure. And that is a passion, a desire to please the senses at whatever cost. Our word hedonist comes from this Greek word. And that applies to having a drive to satisfy your fleshly desires at every level. Sight, smell, taste, touch. Hidden A places the satisfaction of our desires and our pleasure as the ultimate goal. And that goal justifies any means to get there. Not a positive thing by any stretch. It justifies pleasure at the expense of other things that are important. Achieving your fleshly desires and hedone is the ultimate outcome. And that is not for those that are followers of Christ. This is an illustration, uh, this is illustrated and expanded on in verses 2 and 3 by James, so let's look at that. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your hedonism. Yesterday, I guess now, this was the day before yesterday. No, I was thinking about it. Anyway, yesterday, today, yes, three days ago, run all together for me right now, but it was really an insane day. And if this is Tuesday, that was Monday, so it was yesterday. It was loaded with bad news, some of which came from a close friend. <laughs> and lots of frustration. And I didn't have because I did not ask. I wasn't even close to thinking about God during most of the day yesterday. In my case, I did not receive because I didn't ask, but I had totally left God out of my passions in that moment. If I had asked, it would have been wrongly, and it would have been according to the flesh. And I would have been feeding my destructive passions. Part of that frustration was a place that most people rejoice in. The Apple Store. Has anybody ever had a good time at the Apple Store? Anybody hate the Apple Store? Got a, got a mix there. Well... I was having phone issues for three or four days. My phone would reboot, it would, I could have it charging and it would be discharging and die. It was just going insane. I was terrified I was gonna need to spend 500 to 1500 bucks on a new phone, neither of which I could afford because of some of the other frustrations right now. But needless to say, I wasn't really happy with my phone and what was going on. And other distractions of the day pulled me over to Gastonia. So I decided, okay, I'm two minutes from Friendly Shopping Center, which I consider the most unfriendly shopping center ever created. I'm gonna drop by the Apple Store. I'm gonna preface this by saying I have 
one of the best senses of directions of anybody I know. And I mean that seriously. I rarely get lost. In friendly shopping center, finding the Apple store for me is about a 50-50 shot on a good day. And yesterday was not a good day. It took me about five or six minutes once I was there to find the Apple store. So Jimmy was not a happy camper at that moment. I finally got to the store. I parked a block and a half away because I just got all the dings taken out of my car and I was scared to park in those parking spots that are this wide, even though my car is only this wide. But I walked over there, I got in. I was the next in line, but the two, I don't know what you call them, the greeter geeks that are close to the front of the store, there were two of them there and they were talking. So I was trying to be polite. I waited until they finished the conversation. And right as they did, a young guy in a hoodie walked right by me up to him and presented his problem. Now, this, this verse speaks to murder. I honestly had thoughts and visions of murder. I was armed. And at that moment, I probably was dangerous. But I was pretty sure it would reflect poorly on my family and on you guys if, you know, pastor arrested for killing in a frenzy at the Apple store. So I subdued my passion at that moment. I mean, it sounds so silly, but I really was that bit out of shape that that's where my mind was, I'm going to shoot this guy. I knew I wouldn't, but that was the first place my brain went. Then I thought of Jesus. And uh, well, let me get back to it. He got there first and as he was talking to the guy, I took a perverse pleasure in the fact that he said, well, it's going to be a four to five hour wait, or the best part, or you could go to Raleigh. He actually told the kid that. So I said, yeah, go to Raleigh, take off, get out of my way. And then I thought a little more about that. Oh, so, shoot, I can't be here four or five hours. But my mind did finally wander back to Jesus, and I thought about the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. Well, I was good, I didn't murder. But Jesus goes on, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin, but whoever says, you moron, I like this translation, instead of fool, you moron, will be subject to hellfire. So of course I immediately repented of my sinfulness and I prayed for the young man who was no less frustrated than I was and I recognized that. Did I do all that? No, I continued to stew. I almost walked out because I was thinking about that. I can't wait 30 minutes. I got to get back to church. I wasn't even planning to come here but the opportunity was there. And I sure can't wait four or five hours or go to Raleigh. And I'm sure that's what he's going to tell me. Um, I did wait. I talked to the young man. And ten minutes later, I walked out of there with my phone fixed. So there was some iOS snafu that I hadn't heard about, but apparently everybody else has <laughs> that caused all that problem. And I had, all I needed was an update. He did that for me. So the triage tech is what I think I chose to call him. He's the one that says, you know, go to these guys, sorry, set an appointment for two weeks from Thursday kind of guy. But he was able to fix it for me. So my phone was fixed. It was the first positive thing that I felt like had happened to me that day. But I got there safely. That was pretty positive the way I was driving. So here I was. And at that point, I was feeling better, so I forgave the kid. 
Nah, the dark cloud was still there. It broke up a little bit. There was hope of sunshine, but I hadn't gotten there yet. He had still wasted at least two minutes of my time by cutting in front of me, so I wasn't quite ready to let that go yet. And at that point, I learned about the floodwaters at my rental house with the septic tank that was supposed to fix all that, but it was still flooding that. So that replaced my previous worry about my phone. I really forgot about the kid at that point until I was studying for it for this last night. And yeah, at that point I did ask for forgiveness and I actually prayed for his phone and for him. And, but I had hung on to that bitterness for several hours until it passed just because I had other things to be annoyed about. That was a fun day yesterday. So how does this kind, compassionate brother James respond to these kind of failures? He does it with this. You adulterous people! Let's say they come in late. No, nah, that didn't work. <laughs> Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? God, through James here, is lamenting that his beloved creation, that's us guys, we're consumed in the flesh. Our desire is for the creation and all the wonderful things that can be had from the creation rather than being filled with the Holy Spirit and a genuine, genuine love for the creator instead of for what he has created. Now, I read it with emotion, but it does sound like James's emotions were running pretty high here. And I'm not still picking on you, James. We're glad you're here. <laughs> That's the hedonism we talked about before you got here, but you'll have to get the recording. <laughs> and it is often, and thank you, that was a good plug. We're often in that mode of whatever makes us feel good is what we're pursuing. What makes us feel God best is pursuing God. And God and James are lamenting that and with passion, and I'm using that word not necessarily in the negative context, but it is a passionate plea that James makes here. So instead of being filled with the Holy Spirit and the desire for God, we are filled with other desires. One might even say James is a bit ticked off here. So who wrote James? One would think that was James, and we'll get to that. And who was he writing, or to whom was he writing to be proper in English? We have multiple Jameses in the early church, so it really isn't definite. But the prevailing wisdom thinks that this particular James is the younger brother, half-brother, although that's a point that people will argue about that's kind of silly. He was his brother. It was the younger brother of Jesus writing this, is that James. And that it was written about 45 to 48 AD. The conversion of James to believing in his half-brother as the Messiah likely occurred after the resurrection. He was family, but he wasn't friendly family during Jesus' walk on earth. And considering the date of this writing, he almost certainly was writing to Jews, as reaching out to the Gentiles really hadn't taken off at this point. It happened, but it was more unusual. So he is a recent convert to believing his half-brother was the Christ. And... I don't know if you guys know any recent converts to Christ, but 
when most of us get to that point, we are filled with enthusiasm. And sometimes with judgmentalism. But I'm not accusing James of that, just pointing that out to the new believers have the wonderful enthusiasm and sometimes the painful legalism all mixed up together. So considering all this, it's easy to suppose that this zeal of James comes out of missing it for himself for a season and loving his Jewish brothers and sisters enough to not want them to miss the good news that he's found. And that zeal is wonderful. And to miss the gospel is terrible. So James is passionate about that position. He knows the power of the message. He knows of the mission of Jesus. He saw it firsthand. And he says it all in the first few words of verse 6. And I suspect James, who sounded kind of angry in the earlier verses, at this point has as much or more loving tenderness in his words than the intensity of the anger that he expressed before that. And those words are, starting in verse 6, but he gives more grace. I want to pause there, particularly since I said I was going to make this all about grace, and that's where we focus on that. Why does God need to give more grace? Didn't we just learn that when we are living in the lust of the flesh, we are enemies of God? Didn't James just tell us that? So why is there a need for more grace? In our minds, enemies are to be destroyed, not treated graciously. But that sounds strangely familiar too. If we go back to the same Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus taught us anger was a form of murder, just a few verses later in Matthew 5, we read this. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. God made us his sons. That, let that sink in. We are created in his image. We all share the image of of God. We also share in the prideful sin of Adam. Adam could not avoid the temptation of doing things his way. Neither can we. We would not have fared any better in the garden than our father Adam did. Some of us might have done worse but we all would have failed because of that sin of pride. So because we are unrighteous, unworthy sinners, God must give us more grace. Every day and every moment. Think about this for a minute. When Jesus stepped into time and came to his people, the Jews, there were probably more righteous men in that day, men that honestly and wholeheartedly sought to please God in obedience and followed the law than there had ever been in history up to that point. That's possible than have ever been in history up to this point. There were more men pursuing God and righteousness in that day than there had ever been, and probably more percentage-wise at least, than there are now. So why did God come at that time? And also think about this. At that point in history, God had been silent for 500 years. 
There had not been no prophets that wrote anything we're aware of. Men were pursuing God, so maybe God didn't need to speak. But he spoke with the word at that point in time. I'm going to chase a rabbit trail here. It's a brief lesson in the Judaism of the first century. And we've all heard some of it, and some of it's been misrepresented, and some of it we have silly phrases about. But there were many different groups of Jews, particularly in leadership, all, almost all of which were pursuing, at some level or other, being righteous and wanting to please God. The Pharisees are the first. One, we see them as being in power, and they were. They were probably half, maybe more than half, of the Sanhedrin, the ruling class of the Jews. But the word Pharisee actually comes from separatist, separatist the equivalent of separatist in English. They were fundamental, they were conservative, they were legalist. And we see those things as negative now, but those were not negative, mostly as negative. Those were not negative then. Those were good things to be conservative, to be following the law. That's what legalism is. So they were doing what righteous men were supposed to do according to their beliefs of that day. They were, for the most part, honestly pursuing at least following the law of God. And that's the Pharisees. That's who we seem to know the most about. And again, uh, while they did follow the law, they didn't always follow the, follow the spirit of the law, but they were a substantial part of the leadership of the Jews in those days. The next one we also know somewhat about and we suspect John the Baptist was an Essene. These were isolationists. I mean, they went, took the separatism of the Pharisees a step further. The Pharisees wanted to keep holy and not be slimed by the world. The Essenes said, we can't be in the world and not be slimed by the world, so we're going to run away and hide. They had a very strict moral conduct and code. They pursued not just the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law. Today, we would likely look at them as a scary religious cult. They might, it might be easier in your mind to see them as monks of the Middle Ages. They get away from the world so they're not soiled by the worldly things. They did have resources, but they were not about pursuing wealth and power. Then we have the Sadducees. These are, this is probably where I would have been had I been there. Not saying that I'm a great mind, but they were the intellectuals, the thinkers. They tended to be liberal, not the same term as we have here, liberal in the sense that they were, they wanted to look at everything and explore. They were scientific, they were progressive. So many of these words sound familiar to us, don't they? They had a problem with the supernatural. If they couldn't touch it, feel it, I mean, it was a very scientifically based group. And they did not do well with the miracles. They didn't believe in heaven. They would use the, they believed in the Torah, and they would use it to support their positions. But there was a very strong Greek influence among the Sadducees. And they were elitist. Does all that sound familiar to you? I'm not going to compare it to any group because I don't want to get political, but you can probably come up with an idea of who the Sadducees would be today. Then we have the Herodians. They also, we 
get a lot of bad press, but more than they should. They were modern Jews. They believed in God. They tried to keep the Torah. They did the best they can, but they were more secular. They brought God and the world together. They cooperated with Rome, which is why we feel so badly about them. But that was the expedient thing to do. Nobody fought Rome and, and came off well. So they were doing the most desirable thing, if not the thing that they wanted to do, but the thing that was expedient, the thing that kept them alive and kept them in a good place. I would call them American. They would be very American. You know, God and country. The order is flexible. But they were all about Israel. They just didn't want it destroyed by fighting against the Romans. Then we have the Zealots. All right. They were very traditional in keeping the Torah. They were Bible thumpers of their day. They were militaristic. They resisted any foreign influence, up to and including armed combat against the authority, which was Rome. And as we said, not a real healthy thing to do. They also were not organized. They were many splinter groups that were lumped into this zealot category. Today, we would compare that to a religious paramilitary organization. Now, there was a group of those called the Sakari, and they were kind of a subset of zealots. They were the zealot zealots. The name is derived from a weapon which was very much like a dagger that was easy to conceal, and they were quite deadly with them. It was called the Sicarius. So the Sicarii were those that carried the Sicarius. And they were assassins, basically. They'd come up and stab you in a crowded mall and sneak off, and mall being the old term, but that would be the equivalent today. And then run off. That's the group that today we would say were terrorists. They were ancient terrorists. There were quite a few common folk as well, and they really didn't match any of the above, or they were, you know, followers of one or the other. But as is the case today, you know, the common folks aren't politically important enough to really have history take much note of them. And many of those people were drawn to Jesus because they had no power. And finally, as if that wasn't enough, we talked about the Pharisees, the leading Jews. There were two competing rabbinic schools of thought in this time. And one was led by Shammai and the other by Hillel. I don't remember who was teaching, and I probably don't want to tell on them, but somebody was talking about how great Shammai was. Well, I like Hillel myself, so... <laughs> But they were, they were very different. And Shammai's followers were much stronger during this time and much stricter than Hillel. Uh, the actual two leaders rarely debated, and what they debated on wasn't any, all that big a difference. But the, the people that followed them argued about just about everything in the interpretation of the Torah. And to oversimplify this, Shammai was all about the law. And with Judaism, that's a good thing. That is the law. They strictly kept it. Hillel was more about grace and love. And they sometimes did things that were very much against the law of God. The one that comes to mind is for Hillel, any reason to divorce would do, because we don't want to stir things up in the home. So if you're, and this is the one you'll hear often mentioned, if your wife burns the food, you can divorce her. 
That was the whole L group thought, and that was probably, I say some, some pastors agreeing that that's a good thing, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm interpreting the nods of affirmation there. But that was where they were liberal to a fault. They were, the Shammai disciples said, you know, only for sexual sin can you leave your wife. But it was, these two groups were both powerful and argued all the time. And there is an old joke, if you have two Jewish rabbis, you'll have three opinions. I mean, they love to debate and to discuss and argue. Seems like we mentioned arguing earlier in this, but we'll get on. But until the destruction of the temple, the Shammai followers were much more powerful. After that, and probably to this day, Judaism is more leans more towards Hillel and his teachings. And they still have a major influence. The love of God is absolutely a pinnacle for most Jewish believers now. If you talk about chesed, you are going to impress them. If you can even say it, you're going to impress them. I struggle with it. But in any case, that's, that's where Judaism was at that point. And that's where Jesus stepped in. All right, that's enough rabbit trail. That was probably half the teaching, right? I have no idea what time it is. But let's move on. There were gobs of religious people in the time of Jesus. And as righteous as man has been up to that point, and possibly throughout history, that's when Jesus stepped in. And that's when God had been silent for the longest period in the Bible we're aware of. That does seem contradictory, but it's not. And all this is to get back to this point. Religion, which I'm going to define as man's pursuit of God and pursuit of righteousness, has an inherent danger of pride, which is the ultimate sin. When we are pursuing God, we're going to fall into a pride trap there. How many of us are proud about how much better we are now than we used to be? And you can admit that. I get there fairly often. And I'm proud of it, as if it was my doing. It's not. So be careful and listen to this as we continue. And I guess we have to continue pretty quick. Because being old and tired, I'm moving slow tonight. Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it, and it here is referring to the Torah, the law. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We love that verse. I've never encountered the devil I was aware of, so I haven't gotten to resist him, but we'll not go there tonight. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. I want to look at a couple of words here. God opposes the proud is way too tame, a translation. The etymology for opposes is actually a military term of a general setting his troops in battle array. Think about that for a second. That's a general preparing for war. I don't know about you, but I do not want God setting up his army of angels to take me out. Does anybody want to be there? What brings God to this point? Pride. But wait a minute, which is it? God gives us more grace because we are his and he sets his armies against us because of our pride. It can't be both, can it? Because if we're honest, we're not capable of doing what James tells us to do in these verses 7 and 8. 
Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I have trouble resisting a lot less powerful beings than the devil. I have trouble resisting dessert. So, I mean, we say, oh, I'll resist the devil. You won't even know he's coming or he's the devil when he's talking to you if you do if you are important enough for him to pay attention to, and I hope you are, but we're not going to likely resist him without Jesus praying for us like he did Peter. Will he do that? Yeah, he does every day. That's in the Bible. So draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. How do we draw near to God? Some say it's reading the Bible. I don't disagree. Prayer. That's talking to God. That should be drawing near to him. But sometimes when I'm reading the Bible and when I'm praying is when I feel the furthest away from him. So is it my feelings? Or is the drawing done by him at the appropriate time? Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, I'm not even sure what that means, but I want to do it. But I, and I'm going to quit speaking for all of us. I'm going to just speak for me. I can't do it. On my best days, submitting to God is what I want to do, and that's my best days. It's certainly what I want you to believe about me, and that's me posing to pretend I'm submitted to God because I'm a pastor and I read my Bible six hours every day. That's a lie. If I read it six minutes, it's a good day. But those are things that we do to put on that appearance. But that's not what's happening in our hearts. Can I cleanse my own hands? No. Can I purify my heart? No. Can I submit to God? That's something I can at least attempt but even that depends upon him more than it depends upon me. So in my failure, I am now opposed to God. I'm set against his army of angels. It really seems hopeless. But wait, as those silly commercials go, there's more. Let's get on to verse 9. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Thanks, James. I just went from being depressed to suicidal, reading those. I mean, this is why I only read James when I'm already down and need a kick in the butt. But I do love the book of James, just at the right moment. It really, I mean, I, I can't even be cheerful in my oblivious con Fusion. He tells me here, you know, you can't be cheerful. you got to be mournful. It sounds like a hopeless catch-22. And in our strength, it is. I know I can't be righteous even in those rare moments that I want to be. And if I'm not, I'm an enemy of God. And even though he still offers his grace and he loves me, where do I stand? Is anybody else confused or feeling hopeless, frustrated? Let's read on. Verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Okay, finally there's a little bit of hope here. And I'm feeling screwed up enough to be close to humble. In fact, I'm such a worthless worm now that I reek of humility. Wait, that sounded kind of proud, doesn't it? So those armies of angels are now arrayed against me again in my pride. How can a worthless worm be God's image bearer? If we get into what my wife loves to call wormology, of my, you know, this poor, pitiful me, I'm lower than the lowest we get into that, we are rejecting our image of being created in the likeness of our Lord. So what is humility? What's this humility thing mean? If you can figure that out, 
your home. C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. I like that one. St. Augustine, it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men into angels, or as angels. A better thing, because we don't become angels. I like that one, too. But finally, and maybe my favorite by somebody that I even haven't heard of until now, but I found this and loved it. Religion, in its humility, restores man to his only dignity, and that is the courage to live by grace. Ultimately, our victory comes either way. We find our way to humility by putting the needs of others first and before our own. Or in our pride, God arrays his armies against us, and he brings us to the point of humility, realizing we can't oppose him. He comes against us in love, and with armies arrayed against us, who's going to win? We will be brought to humility by God if we aren't willing to accept it by putting ourselves last. We can't oppose God. We can argue with him. We can fight against him. But setting our opposition against him is fruitless. We can destroy ourselves. In fact, one of the, I love this saying about the Ten Commandments that I heard a decade or three ago, but it's, you can't break the Ten Commandments, but you can break yourself against them. We can't win against God, but God is going to win against us even when we're opposing him, and that will be for our good. But it's so much more pleasant when we submit our will to him. That's the more grace that we saw in verse 6. One of my greatest moments in my walk with God was when he showed me he is far more interested in my character and my development than he is in what I do. I do cringe, hopefully not visibly, but when somebody talks about what they are doing for God, it makes me tighten up and step back a step just in case a lightning bolt's coming. What can we do for God? I know what they mean. It's not necessarily a boast of pride, but it misses the point. We want to focus on what God is doing in and through us. All right, let's Try to finish up James before we finish up our time. Verses 11 and 12 illustrate, to some extent, what humility looks like. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? A th- favorite theme of James is the tongue. And here we see ab- 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 admonition against speaking ill of our brothers. And that puts us in the position of judge. And who is the only righteous judge? That gets right back through that progression of pride. We're trying to take the throne away from the only one who has a place on it. The right occupant is our Lord. It didn't work out well for Lucifer when he wanted the throne. It doesn't work out for us either. James got this from Jesus, who was not fond of us judging. And he promises we will be judged in the same manner that we judge others. That, to me, is a very scary proposition. 
I'll think back to that young man in the hood that got in front of me, and man, I judged him harshly in that moment. But it's not my place. Now let's look at the last four verses of, of the fourth chapter here. For some reason I put John instead of Excuse me. James. And it really, initially when I read it, it doesn't seem to fit. I think, well, that should be in chapter 5, not only because I'm running out of time to teach chapter 4, but it just seems like it's sort of out of place. But if we look closely, we might just see where judgment may be useful and even encouraged by James and by God. So 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This is a continuation of the humility as well. But we are, we are supposed to judge ourselves, our motives. Judge your pride. And that way we can avoid the evil of boasting. What is boasting if it's not a verbal expression of pride and arrogance? It's easy to read James and get into wormology. Poor pitiful me. Don't do it. I'll often challenge friends when they are beating the, themselves up over something that if they don't stop, I'm going to be mad at them because they're picking on somebody I love. Now, do I get into wormology? Almost every day. But... God loves us if we have nothing else that is worthwhile in our life. That's all we need. We are beloved children of the creator of the universe. We are image bearers of that creator. It, it's a cliche, but it's true. You are important not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. You're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, not for anything you've done, but for what he has done because of his great love for you. So earlier we looked at the religious folks in Jesus' time. You might have even identified with one or more of these religious groups. God draws everyone to himself. He does it in different ways. And that is his love. Those that come quickest and with the most joy are the children that are responding to his love, not trying to figure him out or acquire his power. Are you a helpless sinner in need of grace? Yes. Are you a beloved child of the king of all kings who is heir to that kingdom? Yes. How can you possibly be both? Don't ask me, ask God. But my final thought is one I've stolen from Steve Brown unashamedly. And you may have heard me say it before, and you'll probably hear me say it again. But it's the only people who get better are people that know that if they never get better, God will love them anyway. And in making sure I got that quote right, I found one more I want to share with you from one of his books, it goes like this. The good news is that Christ frees us from the need to obnoxiously focus on our goodness, our commitment, and our correctness. Religion has made us obsessive, almost beyond endurance. Jesus invited us to a dance, and we've turned it into a march of soldiers always checking to see if we're doing it right and are in step and in line with the other soldiers. We know a dance would be more fun 
but we believe we must go through hell to go to heaven, so we keep marching. Guys, stop marching and start dancing with Jesus through his grace. God loves you, and so do I. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, help us to let go of the pride of thinking we can be good sons of yours. But we're going to do it our way. That's pride. That's the ultimate fall. And that's from the pit of hell. And you won't have any of that. But Lord, help us to recognize that in love you've invited us to dance with you. To be free, to enjoy your lavish gifts. Yes, to love others as you love us. But that comes out of recognizing the love, the grace, the mercy we've received literally with no strings attached. So help us to learn to love, to be gracious, to be forgiving in the way that Jesus has been for us. And we pray this in the power of his name and also know that he is praying for us. So Lord, we join you in that prayer because that's where the power is. In Jesus' name, amen.